You're listening to the AID Network. But Charlie Brown, it's Thanksgiving. What's that got to do with anything? This what you call a Thanksgiving Day dinner? Did we come across town for this? We're supposed to be served a real Thanksgiving dinner. Now wait a minute, sir. Did he invite you here to dinner? Or did you invite yourself and us too? Gee, I never thought of it like that. Have cooking utensils will travel. <laughs> I don't feel bad for myself. I just feel bad because I ruined everyone's Thanksgiving. I love a challenge, and this sure as heck looks like one. You never had Grandma's sweet potatoes. This is true. A cup of butter, a cup of brown sugar, and some marshmallows. I'm starting to like them already. Skip the piece of resistance, just give me a piece of pie. Giving is more than eating, Chuck. You heard what Linus was saying out there. Those early pilgrims were thankful for what had happened to them. And we should be thankful, too. We should just be thankful for being together. Good morning, friends, and welcome back to Adventures in Design. Hey, old friends, welcome back to Adventures in Design. It's Old Friends Come Home Week. All week long on AID. That's right, five friends travel back to Adventures in Design just in time for the holidays. Just in time to be around their friends, their family, members of the Circle of Trust. I want to thank all of my friends out there and members of the Circle of Trust that reached out to Beth and I. Uh, We live in Long Beach, which is about 35 miles, give or take, from Malibu. Uh, A lot of the fires happened on the other side of the hills. Uh, We have been more than safe down here. Uh, We're in a red flag warning, which means that this entire area could burn up. But we are beyond safe. We really haven't seen that much ash in the air, if if any at all. Uh, The sky hasn't changed like it has in the past when we had the fires in Anaheim Hills. But we do smell the smoke when we go outside and the wind's blowing. That being said, though, when a fire of that magnitude just rips through the land, I heard last night a stat that at one point the fire was growing the size of a football field per second. Think about that. That's 300 yards. Imagine just that. Boom. Gone. And now imagine it again. There's no way that you could outrun that. There's no way that an animal could get away from that. I mean, that is actual, total devastation. Now, these folks are all well-to-do people. I would say 99% of them. It's been interesting watching $10 million homes burn on the local news. And then they're like, oh, yeah, don't worry. Uh, The firefighters were able to get their Ferraris, both of them, out of the garage. But it doesn't make the devastation any that more just that, total devastation. And what it does is it puts the burden uh, of all of this on all of us, the citizens of Los Angeles, Uh, They call us Los Angelitos, I believe, if I got that right. I don't know. I've only been here five and a half years. I should probably learn. And one of the things that 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 created was all of the animal shelters in that area have been burnt down and destroyed. Therefore, those animals that were in the shelter needed to be moved somewhere. And then all of the pets that need a, a holding station, they need to go somewhere. So... The animals that were just, you know, waiting to be adopted, uh, they got a clock ticking on their heads, each and every single one of them, because there's just not enough room. So if you find that you have room in your home or have room in your heart, there are a tremendous amount of animals in this area that need to be taken in. And uh, yeah, yesterday, me and Tasty Yummies, Tasty Yummies and I, we went to Beverly Hills and we grabbed this little trash dog. We don't know who he is, where he came from, who he belongs to. But as of right now, he's here with us, home with us. So old friends come home to AID. We literally have, I think we're going to call him Larry, uh, chilling in the couch right now. Last time I saw him, looking serious paws. So we're safe. We're fine. And I can't thank all of you enough that have reached out to me to make sure that we're doing okay. The AID headquarters, as you know, airtight, 
uh, nuclear disaster tight. We will keep broadcasting long and after the apocalypse. And as we do so, we will always be sponsored by our friends over at jackprince.com. Make sure you head over there, and if you shop, go to jackprince.com slash circle of trust to save from shopping at our friends at Jack Prince. They've got a tremendous sale going this month on stickers. And I don't know if you know this or not, but if you do a sticker order through Jack Prince, if you keep the same size, if you keep the same dimension, same die cut, same colors, you can change the design as often as you want. Think about this. If DKNG wanted to make stickers of all their icons, because all their icons are circles, they could literally do an order of a thousand and rotate it every, what, 50 or a hundred to, uh, to make sure that they got all their icons turned into stickers. So that kind of works through your mind how that works. Today's show and the entire week of Old Friends Come Home is sponsored by my friends, The Circle of Trust. We have a tre- tremendous, what am I, am I Trump today? I don't, I've been watching too much news this weekend. We have an amazing thing that happens this week. November 14th will be the four-year anniversary of me saying, hey, guys, I've been doing this as a hobbyist for two years. I want to turn this into my career. As of today, you can become a member of the Circle of Trust and get bonus content. But even more than that, like I don't even want people to think that they're paying for the bonus content. I want people to think that they're paying for all of this because all of the free shows, every minute that you've ever heard on AID the last four years, Jack Prince has been amazing, uh, Pin Game Strong, Dot com. They've been a fantastic partner. Grizzly Wheeler's come on board. What a great guy Josh Wheeler is. But the real bulk of all of this has been paid for by people that see the value in it. So it's not just getting the bonus content. It's keeping adventures in design live and happening. It's, it's the money that I've used to turn this into my career, my full-time career. And we hit that anniversary on November 14th. And I, I can't thank the people enough that have seen the value in this being here and have decided to support Adventures in Design being here five days a week uh, for four years. I think we're at today 860-something episodes. I've stopped counting, but I have to count because it keeps things organized. So I think all of you enough, or I can't thank all of you enough. Uh, it's been a wild weekend. For your love and your support and making sure that I have my job and that you have your show. Uh, and if you're a free listener and you've been a free listener for years, I'm going to just turn up the guilt knob to 11 right now. This is only here because somebody else paid for it. And every day you're showing up and you're, you're hitching a ride on, on their train. Uh, you're eating food off their plate. You're eating food off my plate. And I do the free show only to recruit new people to what the circle of trust is. If, if I thought that I could, I would never put another episode up for free as long as I live. Because I'll point this out to you. I know radio was free, right? Like you could, your whole life, turn on a radio and there was music and talk and news and entertainment there for you for free. But I want you to keep in mind that that radio that you heard for free was part of the radio industry, which was a million dollar industry, billion dollar industry. Those radio stations made tons of money. Those guys on the radio had really nice jobs. It cost money elsewhere. So the idea that podcasting and podcasters should go to work and show up every day for free is absolutely ridiculous. Podcasting is not radio, and radio is not podcasting. It's time that we all roll up our sleeves and decide if there's content out there that we like that we should be paying for it. Every other bit of media in your life you pay for, why in the fuck should podcasting be the one thing that's always free? So to my members of the Circle of Trust that four years ago, way ahead of the curve, said this is content that I want to bring in my life. I enjoy everything that I've learned, all the people that I've met, and the companionship, and I want to pay for it. To you, thank you. You were a visionary. You were there with me. You were the first people to ever think about we should pay for podcasting. And you and I, we did that together. We created the first ever Monday through Friday, uh, 200 episode a year podcast all around the world of creative thinking and turning your passion into a career. We did that. You and I, we did that. I sat here and, and found the people and recorded the episodes and wrote the questions and studied everybody. And you listened on the other end. 
and you paid your monthly subscription and you commented on the episodes that you like and you told people that came on the show that you enjoyed them and you shot from Jack Prince and you made AID look good. People know when they come on this show that they get hurt and that people find their way back to them and say, Benny Gold, I love it when you're on Adventures in Design. Gerald Tidwell, I love it when you come on AID. I've learned so much from you. We did that together. We made history together, and we're going to keep on doing it. I'm not stopping. I love this job. 800 and something in, I feel like I'm figuring out where the future is. I've got big plans for next year. And once again, I owe it to all of you, my members of the Circle of Trust. I'm going to wrap this up right now. I don't even have notes in front of me. I didn't know I was going there, but I just feel so much love in my heart after this weekend and bringing this trash dog into my life that I wanted to thank all of you for being a supporter of Adventures in Design and for giving me the best job. So now what do I say on the 14th? I don't know. I don't know. But this week, I'm very excited because we've gone on so far that people have wandered in and they wandered out of the AID universe. This week, I picked five friends that I know that you all love. These are five very popular guests, and some of them we haven't heard from in months. Some of them we haven't heard from in years But I thought with Thanksgiving being in the air, what a great week-long special to bring old friends back to Adventures in Design and to give us that vibe of catching up. And just because you don't talk to somebody doesn't mean you don't think about them, and it certainly doesn't mean that you still don't care for them or love them. And I love each and every one of you that have supported the show. Free listeners, you're on notice. Nah, thanks for showing up. Thank you for showing up, all of you. This has truly been a blessing. Ladies and gentlemen, our first friend on today's Old Friends Come Home to AID Week, Dave Clock. You love Dave Clock. He's one of the most popular co-hosts I've ever had. Dave and I were, were doing a live show here for a while uh, in Fairfax when I was working on some other stuff. Dave has been a homie to the show, and I know that he's one that makes you laugh. His, watching his career take off has been fascinating. Uh, he always downplays his success, but don't let him downplay it to you. The guy's very successful, slowly becoming one of the more popular illustrators uh, and printmakers in the Los Angeles area. Old Friends Come Home Week, Episode 1, everybody's favorite best friend, Mr. It's a quiet Dave Clark. celebration with family and friends. A time for counting blessings, a time to make amends. There's a feeling all around you, you can hold. Welcome to Old Friends Come Home Week on Adventures in Design. Welcome home, friends. Oh, eat a piece of pie for me. Dave Clock, welcome. Welcome back home to Adventures in Design. This is the third home of mine you've been. Second home. Third. Third? Oh, you're. The old shop. Yes, when you were. Squatting. Squatting. Yeah, yeah that's right. Squatting. That's right. That's where we recorded for the first time. You know, what I wanted to do on this week that goes right into the Thanksgiving holiday, I wanted, to, I wanted to do a special called Old Friends Come Home. <laughs> and it's a week where old friends, people that I know the audience loves, find their way back to Adventures in Design <laughs> just in time for the Thanksgiving holiday. It's good to check in. It is good to check in, and you've had quite a busy year, and I've done this with one other person. I'm going to do this with you. When you sent me over like a brief line listing of everything you'd done in the last year, I realized that you had had, once again, a very big year in your career. Yeah, felt good. And so I thought what would be fun is just to review your Instagram (laughs) and look in through your life, and people can follow along. And uh, I wish we had R2-D2 that would beep when it was time to go to the next one. But th- this is where I'm starting at, Dave. I'm starting at this cover. Is that last year? Oh, oh, that's 
I'm, you, right? Yeah, this, I'm starting at uh, December 12th, 2017, when you were our fourth tube of Christmas, and it says, Happy Hanukkah, Dave Clock. You know, I'm a big fan of Hanukkah. Yeah, it's coming around again, I think. It, or it's gone. Who knows? <laughs> it's it's the religious rave. You bet. Nobody knows what eight days this warehouse party is going to happen. And you uh, you can ask all your Jewish friends, and they'll be like, yeah, I don't know. I don't, and you, I don't, everybody plays coy, right? Because like Bricky, we're not giving you the invite, but I will. I will go down fighting, thinking that there's somebody me needs to make Hanukkah into a bigger deal. It's eight days of gift. It's Christmas it's times day. eight. It's Columbus Day at best. <laughs> no man, wait till I get a hold of it. <laughs> wait till I get a hold of it. That's just what Jewish holidays need. Mark Bricky, <laughs> <laughs> he's from Kentucky. Wait till the Goyim gets a hold of it, right? Right. All right, so let's, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to jump in and just look it over. And, uh, you know, obviously, it's I, I counted it up. It's 135 slides, so we can't comment really? on all. But you have had a very productive year, and I think that the audience would love to know what you've been up to. I'm sure they'd also love to hear how uh, last year's Hanukkah gifts that I showered on yeah. you, if, if those have been put to good use. You bet. They really have. And uh, I also thought that it would be interesting for me to maybe um, – Bring another gift by. It's just a quiche. So let's jump it in. Let's jump it in. I'm going to go over to 2018 Dave Clock screen print subscription. Oh, yeah. So you did do a screen print subscription for this year? Yeah, it's still going. Man, what a year for people to sign up and to buy one. Yeah, never doing it again. Really? Is <laughs> Absolutely. That, is that your advice to never do it again? Uh, I didn't think my year would go as well as it did. Yep. And I thought it was like... I priced everything out in this weird hypothetical like projection. Yeah. I was like, people are going to be getting like X amount of posters where if they bought each one individually, they'd be paying a certain amount. And if they did the subscription, they'd get about 40 to 50% off. So throughout the year, it you know they would get a good deal. And after a few months, it was like they're all getting posters that are sold out for 15 bucks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And now I'm like, all right, I have 30 Metallica posters to sell. And a bunch of them are just going to subscribers. Yeah. And in obviously you appreciate the subscribers. Absolutely. But what maybe one of those people might not get is that the 30 that are going to subscribers or whatever, like the, on a job like the Metallica gig, which you crushed, like that is our bonus. Like right. that's where we make that's our most payment. That's where we make the most amount of money. Right. So if those are all spoken for. Yeah. Have you been doing little ships or are you going to do all shipping at once? Uh, every two months, except okay. I've got one guy in New Zealand who gets a half a year and then at the end of the year. Yeah. So your advice to your fellow poster makers that are thinking about like, hmm, I, I could use the capital. I could use some money in January to sort of yeah. have some seed money for my next year. Your advice is? I, you know what? I'd still tell myself to do it. I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> what an honest answer. Because, like, I don't know. You can't pre you can't predict that stuff. And it it was cool when I put it up to get people. I'm like, look at these people, like, saying, like. What did it cost? 500 bucks. Oh, yeah. I mean, when one of those goes through your PayPal or whatever shopping cart you have. Yeah. You're like, wow. Selling a poster for 25 bucks is one rush, but getting the $500 payment from five people today, I feel like I'm doing something here. But, you know, each tube, they're getting like five to eight prints. Right. So it's like they're getting those for about 10 bucks a piece, and those are, you know, on my store for 40 to 60 bucks. That's um, that's pretty wild when you, when you look at the fact that you had no idea that your year was going to pop so hard. Yeah. You know, it's been a really crazy year for you. Moving up to December 21st, you did a poster for uh, the story so far. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, on here you did that 60s Fillmore yeah. typography. Is that something that you enjoy doing? It, it, like, do you have a plan for that or do you just make one letter in the next one and that determines the shape for the next one? Uh, I drew a blob and filled it in. Is that but what you that do? band's from San Francisco. So you want to do a... That was the note. Got it. Got it. So they wanted to tie into it. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, a lot of good chicken sandwiches. Thank you. They're still great to this day. Yeah. I saw one... We'll get to that, I guess, later on where you had a lurker pop up. Uh, <laughs> you really believe in art as a gift. Oh, Yeah. 
I really believe it. And you've done it for your amazing girlfriend. And you bet. Is this where we tell everybody to make sure to watch the Norm McDonald show on Netflix? I, yeah, you, after every post, man. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, make sure you watch the Norm McDonald show. Norm uh, McDonald has a show on Has Netflix. a show. Do this. Hit play. Make sure you have play next episode turned on and just do that every time you leave the house. Yep. Just let the season play and then Dave knows that they can pay the rent here next month. You bet. <laughs> what a plan. <laughs> Dude, I've been known to tell people like, just put my YouTube channel on. Just put it on. And go on vacation. You know <laughs> about that band, um, <sighs> Wolf, no, Wolfpack. I don't know Wolfpack. They did, it's Wolfpack. It's Pack. Wolf, I think it's Wolf, V-U-L-F. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, they went to the same school I did, University of Michigan. Uh, they did a thing called Sleepify, where they had an album that was just silent. And oh, they wow. told everyone to put it on when they went to sleep so that they could afford to go on tour off of the money they made from it. <laughs> and they have like a bunch of weird plans like that. And the main guy from the band was on CNN, like the money market show. That's amazing. Yeah. He found a hole in the system and a way to take care of it. They sued them. I, they should, yeah, because it's illegal what they did. And right. whenever I say that, I'm always joking, not joking right. to my audience at home. Uh, but you did an, an amazing illustration for uh, your amazing girlfriend, yeah, Alexis. And, you bet. Shout out to Alexis. And you, you like to give art as a gift, and people have hired you before to give yeah. art as a gift. Yeah, and you love that. I think it's a great idea. It shows, you know, because money was spent, time was spent, effort. You know, a lot of thought. It's great. And it is that the ultimate and the personal touch. Right. I do think, though, that it might be from you like, uh, hey, honey, don't forget I'm talented. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, the drawing that I gave her was an idea she had uh, from a bit before. It was like an inside joke that I illustrated. Yeah, of her head sort of cut open and the cats running the place. <laughs> it's just like a big cat rumpus room. No, it was just in the new house. I yeah. didn't see a cat yet. No, we uh, we tried the cat thing and it, we brought our buddy cat from our old place over. Yeah. And he was an outdoor cat. Yeah. And he loved us. And then we brought him over and he did not love walls. Mm. And after a week, we had the hard decision to say, got to take him back to his spot. We dropped him off back at the old place, and he's still just in the backyard. That's his domain, huh? Yep. That's, that's the th spot. That's interesting. He's safe. He doesn't hit the streets. He just hangs out in the backyards. I saw a dog on the way over here today, and I couldn't tell if anybody owned him, and there was like tons of humans all around. I'm like, well, one of those people can take care of the dog. Yeah. But I was doing that whole like out of the corner of my eye, like if he gets in the road, then I pull over. Right. And I cancel the interview, and now I'm a, I own a second dog. <laughs> but it, it never went that way. Um. Tell me about the poster you did for the New Tradition Co. Motorcycle Show. Ah, fun fun note on this one. With more of a fine-tuned eye, read the text on that poster back to me. New Tradition Co. Motorcycle Show. What am I missing? You're not missing anything. You're adding the correct spelling of motorcycle as I printed all of those <laughs> oh, <Marcel. laughs> without the right amount of c's in the most important word motorcycle motorcycle ah uh, well <sighs> just a the, the dave clock touch happens to be spelling errors and i'll never let that die well you know daniel danger does decaying buildings mike mitchell does fat birds yeah. you you misspell i misspell shit we all have our thing uh this went through four rounds of approval and that was on all of them. And then I printed hundreds of them and sent them off and they sold them at this event. And I didn't know about this until two months later when someone framed it and tagged me in it and went, framed this poster and the spelling error. <laughs> <laughs> so with this, you got hired to do uh, an event poster. Uh huh. Do you enjoy getting out of the world of like bands yeah. and doing an event? I, I always love a good event poster. Yeah. And the thing is, the guys who run this are in bands. Oh, cool. So they came at it with cool. kind of a, like, we want a band poster for our motorcycle show, motorcycle show. We want a rock and roll vibe. What you did in this print that I've never been able to successfully do is the negative space, uh -huh. which is the, the color of the paper, which you're using as the cool, like, smoke clouds. Yeah. Um, I've always been envious of people that can kind of put that in there and make it look al naturel and not f Thank you. forced. Is that... Does that get a little bit stressful, though, that you know you have to leave those channels open and screen printing and you're afraid that something might fall into that, that open pocket? Uh, 
Yeah, but that like I knew this was going to be a three color, and I knew that I was going to have to use the color of the paper, mm -hmm. and I was like planning on having most of it being filled up by that smoke. It was part of the planning. On something like this, a lot of people would do half of it and flip it, and you made it look pretty symmetric, but it's definitely a full rendered illustration. There's there's no oh, yeah. shortcut here on this one. That's the beauty of just drawing an actual symmetrical engine yeah. and then filling around it. Yeah. Um, yeah, motorcycle parts are just super cool looking. On something that's just this like piled up, how much of a how how different did your sketch look than this? Look just like this. How long does it take you to get to that sketch to figure out how to perfectly pile everything up? Uh, I you know what I said to them, uh, hey, you guys send me the reference stuff because I might be like, it might be like the skateboard equivalent of me just doing the the uncool Walmart skateboard right, and not right. knowing the difference. Check so it they, out, it's a T Rex. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, I was like, you guys send me a hundred picks and i'll just scoop out the interesting looking parts but they all have to be like cool motorcycle parts yeah because you know like the bike at the top they were like this has to be the bike oh so they're like this is sort of what resonates with our customer right and that engine is like their like signature engine because i could have just been like you know it's like a big ball with some wires coming out of it <laughs> yeah. put it in your motorcycle so it's great to have yeah. an insider be like no this is what a snowboard looks like in 2019. Right. Don't go Googling and coming up with the Walmart version. You you absolutely knocked that out. And the thing that I got the most notes on, do you see the engine on that bike? So the engine above the engine? Yeah. They were like, all right, it's only got four of those screws in that main thing. Yeah. It should have six. And I wow. Was like, okay. Wow. <laughs> you know, and I was like, that's fine. I love that people are catching that detail, but not the Cs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and I loved the whole pro like they were great to work with, and I was like, oh, <laughs> "This is a good one." And then I sketched motorcycle show. I haven't had anyone point that out without me pointing it out. You know what's interesting though is you put the word motorcycle <laughs> spelled wrong <laughs> next to images of motorcycles, yeah. and the brain sees enough to be like, "That says motorcycle." Hundred percent. That's it, there's enough pieces there to just keep on going. Hundred percent. It's a, this is a total lesson. Yeah. Uh, moving up. You got to do, January 5th, you released your first poster for the L.A. Kings. Yes. Which is something that you love. You bet. <laughs> Maybe you've seen my good friend Carl there, who's the ringside uh, announcer. What's his last name? Her name. Carl and oh, Bathe. Yes. Carl. Oh, a few years ago. Yeah, well, she's there now every game. What? She's, really? Yeah, if you watch the Kings on, on air. Oh, oh, on air. I thought you meant like live at a game. No, she's not the arena girl anymore. She's now their, like... Uh, on ice correspondent. So if you watch the Kings you bet. on the the Fox Sports Fox Sports West, yeah, you'll see my buddy Carl on there uh, doing all the games, every awesome. home game. Yeah, yeah. And I've I've got to learn a lot about the L.A. Kings through being buds with her. That's awesome. And I learned that you got to do a gig poster for the L.A. Kings. Yeah, this is my first of two, and they let me curate this year's list of artists. Oh, really? Yeah, and I did a few. Uh, Last year, too. Wow. Uh, I got Bruno Guerrero, Brunoovsky on Instagram. He did one. Derek Deal did one. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, Kyler Smith mm -hmm. does all the 1988 trading cards. Yeah. He did the first one. Uh, there's some more coming out. How many are you doing? I'm doing one in April yeah. this year. Did how does, um, how does a gig poster for a sports team how does that translate how does that jump the, the, the fence does they that, does that work out it, yeah well the thing is they're they're offset yeah but and i mean they, visually though yeah i mean i don't I, I i'm pretty sure people aren't like um is this not my dnl <laughs> right but it, well they print twenty thousand of them oh so they're really limited edition <laughs> you bet yeah if you missed out there's no um, way to get one sorry subscribers <laughs> yeah. these are really low we can't put one of these in your tube don't look too close those <laughs> might also be the packing peanuts that i'm using <laughs> smashed up poster but how was this how was this perceived or how did it go over with fans? oh it was great uh my mom happened to be in town so i brought her to that game yeah and they did you buy her chicken sandwich yes i did yeah uh is that not like a couple pictures later? I think it is. Hey, don't time travel on me. Okay. Uh, I'm stuck in January 6th. We're never going to get to the end of the year. Oof. Um, what was I saying? I was asking how this goes over oh. because a sports fan yeah. might not necessarily be an art fan. Right. Uh, it was a lot of 
parents. It was a day game, uh-huh. which are usually full of kids. Uh-huh. So there's a lot of parents being like, here, like this is a cool. So they're the giveaway. Oh, okay. You walk in on the way out, you get one of these. Do you wish that it would have been a more like silkscreen, limited edition, 18 by 24 type gig? Uh, when I had first pitched it to them, I said like, we'll do the giveaway but then we'll do a premiere, a premiere for like yeah. season ticket holders or like the front office people. Yeah. yeah. And they were like, you know what? We've got, we got to do something like this for every game. We're over our heads and stuff. Like, let's just do the giveaway. And I was fine with that. But in your heart of heart, do you wish that you had one of these that you could frame and hang up that was silk screened? No. No. Interesting. Uh, it's just a different thing. Yeah. Okay. You know? Interesting. Uh, I love the way that you knocked it out, though. It looked really Thanks. cool. And I, I I know you went with the audio, the obvious of mascots fighting, but it yep. worked out well, and it was cool to see that in your style. Uh, January 8th, you were a guest on 20 Creatives, 18 Minutes on AID. Yes. That was fun. You were t- all, all of your bits were about um, getting sick and never doing a corn maze again, which I found oh that. Oh, my God. I found that to be really good advice that everybody could take to yeah. heart. And uh, so far, I'd like to compliment you. So far, we're like 11 months in this year, and none of my listeners have, have said, you know what? I got really sick in a corn maze. So I think the kids listen to the clock, listen man. Listen up. Check your spelling. Don't do those <laughs> corn mazes. <laughs> he saves lives, ladies and gentlemen. He <laughs> saves lives. So as I'm clipping through here, I realize that, one, you go to a lot of Kings games. But you bet. two, you're you're just always creating. You're always making. And one of the things that you're always doing, too, is making friends with comedians. And I'm looking at February 1st. I see you next to a guy who's a comedian. Yeah. And I don't know his real name. Uh-huh. I just know this guy as Randy on Netflix's Love. Yes. And this guy, <laughs> he stole the show of every scene that he was in. You bet. Me and my wife would watch it, and he'd come on. We're like, yes, Randy, yeah. like Randy and Birdie were the whole show for us. Yeah. And this guy is a fucking amazing comedic actor. You bet. He plays a sad sack of shit better than anybody I've ever do it yep. in my life. Mike Mitchell. Is that his name? Uh-huh. What a guy. So this is, uh, for Christmas, Alexis got me in on a podcast taping of his podcast, Doughboys. Oh, cool. And it's a fast food chain restaurant mm-hmm. podcast. And I drew them. Their rating system is on forks, out mm-hmm. of five forks. Yeah. So this is a thumbs up made out of five forks. That's great. And it's them holding it. Man, what a what a great actor that guy is. Like really, really so good funny. at his character. And and everybody knows that moment when a friend's like, I'm gonna get I'm gonna hook you up. Like I got a hook up. And yeah. then you go there and you're like, the hookup sucks. And there was an episode where he's like, Don't worry, my family has a place in Palm Springs. Right. Oh, that was so painful. <laughs> it was so far from Palm Springs. <laughs> yeah. So far from being what we all think of Palm Springs. It was like a mobile home in the fucking desert. Yeah. And God, what a great, what a great episode. Hey there, friends. I hope you're enjoying Old Friends Come Home Week all week long on Adventures in Design. Today we got Dave Clock stopping by. You know, I love this guy so much. And, and and I want to see him succeed that he was the best person that I could give my print shop to. And I could have broke it all down and sold it, but it wouldn't be worth the money. The, the, the feeling of giving it away and knowing that it went to a good home and knowing that it's here in Los Angeles and that if I ever needed to use it, it's still there. That's tremendous to me. I hope you're enjoying today's episode. And I would beg of you that if you are a free listener, Could you please go over to whatever platform you're listening to us today, and could you please give us a nice rating and review? I I, I don't don't really do a good job of telling people, like, hey, five-star, smash like. I I don't do a good job of doing that, and it bites me in the ass because people just listen and they don't do it. So I'm just asking of you, if you enjoy Old Friends Come Home to AID Week, could you do your old friend Mark Bricky a favor? Could you just go over to whatever platform you listen to us daily and just take the extra two minutes to write a quick couple of lines, five-star uh, ranking, and just help us aggregate higher so more people are showing up, more people are listening to us, and just kind of remind everybody, Adventures in Design is the OG in this space. We are the professional podcast here for you Monday through Friday, entertaining you, keeping you in the loop, on all the chicken nuggets that you need to build a tasty career. Wherever you're listening today, please give us a five-star ranking, leave a little review, and if you can, tell a friend. Invite a friend home to Adventures in Design, where all creatives are family. All right, so you also 
in February, you were hired by um, Yahoo to do yeah. an amazing <laughs> illustration of every team's road in to the playoffs yeah. for last year's Super Bowl. Yes. Dave, this is an insane <laughs> illustration. My my first question is, what did they end up doing with this? That's the low light of this. I have no idea what they did with it. So you just literally turned in. Like, this is the original? Yeah. You didn't do it on a Wacom. You uh-huh. did it on paper. Uh-huh. And you're like, hey, here's your drawing you ordered. Yep. And they say, <laughs> see you later. Yeah. I mean, there was a ton of back and forth because... It's laid out, it looks like just a blob of madness, but it's laid out in a playoff bracket format. Yeah, I can kind of see that. Where the teams that were eliminated from the playoffs are on the perimeter. Yep. And then literally goes round by round in a vertical, like 20% in are the teams from the second round, 40% in towards the center in each direction are the teams that were in the conference finals. Yeah. And then the teams in the Super Bowl are the teams in the middle. And it's mostly, it's, some are mascots, some are just like iconography from the city. So like Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, I think that's just like a bunch of steel girders. Yeah. Um, no, I'm looking around at it. I mean, you, you've you got mascots in here. You've got, you know, calls to action from their city. I mean, you know, the Chargers is hard. So you got two guys putting a lightning bolt in a, yeah. in a, in a truck. In a moving truck because they were moving. Truck. Poor Chargers. I mean, they really need to when the new stadium opens up in Inglewood, they need to rebrand that team yeah. because they literally play 16 away games because they don't have a home audience Whoa. anymore. That's not easy. No, no. I mean, when they play here where the Galaxy plays at that StubHub Arena, uh-huh. that's the game where people are like, hey, we should go see the Chiefs play an away game this year. Let's go to the one in L.A. and we'll make an L.A. weekend out of it. Yeah. So the poor Chargers, every game they play, the fans are full. Or the, or the, the stands team. are full of fans for the opposite uh, team. So what a hard thing to do. All right. So let's let this is what people want to know. And this is why I'm glad AID exists. So you get this gig. Two number one questions I have to ask you. Hit me. One, how do you plan out something like this? Uh, I propose doing it in a playoff bracket. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. Um, and then it was just tons of pencil sketches. I was on a day rate. And I was supposed to do this whole thing in four days. (laughs) And that turned into two weeks, which turned into three weeks. And I was like, I'm loving this. Wow. Because I was on a day rate and I was just, and they were like, hey, like, it looks like you got more time. Like, hey, we can buy you some more time. And they were just really cool about it. And so you, you negotiated that you wanted to do it on a day rate. Yeah. And so you figured out a rate that you felt comfortable putting a good six hours in a day. Uh, like a 10 or 11. Jesus. And so you thought it would get done in four days and it took how many? Three weeks. Three weeks. So 15 days or 21? I think 21. God, God, Dave. And it was cool. Like, uh, I was, you know, less and less invested in like, cause they were saying initially this was going to be a mural in Minneapolis where the Super Bowl was. Yeah. And I was like, boy, that's awesome. But I bet I would have had to do it three weeks ago so they could put it up. Because like, the Super Bowl is like days away. Yeah. Do you think the fact that it took three weeks is the reason why nothing big ever came out of it? No, because I was always going up to the point they said I had. Oh. I was always ready to turn it in. I was just adding and adding and adding. Oh. You know, if they were like, oh, turns out we need it. I'd be like, all right, here it is. But how are you showing them revisions if it's... A one, did you like draw the whole thing in pencil and then ink it at the end? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you were just laying down the pencil, laying down the pencil. And then eventually when that was agreed upon, then you're like, all right, now I'm going to do the final ink. Yeah. So you basically sit down one day, trace your own work and then put in all the detailing. Mm -hmm. Wow. What an interesting thing that really makes you appreciate the world of Photoshop yeah. and like, Oh yeah, I can, let me just put up a mask and I can take half of the skull out, put a, a, a one in that's winking. Cause I know you need the skull to wink at somebody. And there was a lot of like, there was a lot of times where I'd have to remind them like, Hey, I hear, here's what I have just reminding you this exists. Yeah. So if you want me to redo something, I have to add whatever is around what you just made me get rid of. Jesus. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because People love to say, oh, could you just take that out? Right. And you're like, but you don't understand. It's not a real world. Nothing right. exists There's underneath nothing behind it. that. Yeah, that is 
in a way, you got to take that as a compliment, though, that they just think, well, yeah, just pull out that buffalo. Right. Well, just pull it out. You know that all the other lines just lead up to the buffalo. Right. That's kind of how this art gimmick works. Yeah. It's not a photo, guys. No, it, it, there's not anything behind it here. So moving up, I see this illustration that you did. Uh, well, a gig poster, I should say, for Trey Anastasio. Mm -hmm. It's great, Dave. Thanks, man. I really love when you do the ribbon look. Me too. It's so much fun. Is it fun? It's my favorite. Is it relaxing to do that? It's the best. It looks very... It looks like once you get it all dialed in and it's just actually doing the ribbon and doing the shading and figuring out your light source and sort of giving each one its own flow, it looks like such a relaxing day at the drawing board. I, if a band was like, hey, will you do one of those ribbon? I could, yep, whatever you want. Yep, I'm in it. I'm in. I just did that for Nine Inch Nails. It looks it looks really great. And it, I see that this is kind of one of your go-to styles that you, you come back to from time to time again, yeah. which is interesting because you're a guy that really likes to hop around a lot. Work for me this, the background yeah. that adds so much speed and, and, and clarity to this sort of weird world that you're creating. Thanks. How do you get that background to flow so well? There was a lot of push and pull on that. Yeah? Yeah, like when you flip through... You know, progress one JPEG, progress two JPEG. And yeah. it's like, you just go through it. It's mostly just the background flickering around. Like, really just trying to get it to where it doesn't take too much away from the main character? Yeah. I wanted some brightness back there because I didn't want too much of that blue. Yeah. there was I couldn't find that blue in paper. So it's white paper. Mm. The first hit is just that entire blue. Oh, that's a fun day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of ink. Uh, Are you a big um, Guillermo del Toro fan? I am. Yeah, you really, um, it almost seems like his world is next door to yours. If he wants to have me over, I'll bring sandwiches. It, it seems as if, like, if you think of the world that he's created for all of us, yeah. you might be, well, you're that mobile park on the outskirt of, yeah. just like Randy's house, yeah. family house that's in Palm Springs. Right. That's how you're adjacent to is his Something world. on fire? <laughs> when you do this style of text. Yeah. Do you send that over to the band and be like, Does, "Is this legible enough for you before I ink it?" Yeah, yeah. Uh, that you know, the text is on a separate layer mm -hmm. so that they can approve it. This type of artwork that you do here with this character, mm -hmm. how hard is it for you to get that light source like that? Uh, it's not hard, but there's definitely moments where you're like, "It's good, but not great," uh -huh. and then you add like a little highlight way off, and you're like, "Oh, that's right." Are you printing with transparent inks at the end to sort of give it this amount of depth? Yeah, transparency definitely help that. Yeah, big time. Big, big time. time. Yeah, this is great. I, I looked at this and I'm like, man, this is so good. And that's only in February. I hope that he can keep up this pace. He doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> then the accident. Look at you with some Timbits. Oh, yeah, Timbits. That was at the Bell Center in Montreal. Oh, yeah. Montreal, what a great city. Love it. Went there for Thanksgiving. Colder than a well digger's asshole, though. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it is cold. No one said that before, but I agree with you. It is cold there, man. It is so cold in that town. Yeah. Um, do you try to get out to a lot of hockey games on the road? Yeah. I just went to Nashville, Edmonton in Nashville last weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. What is your favorite arena to see a game at that's not Staples Center? <sighs> Staples is kind of the best. Yeah. People but hate it because it's shared by so many other teams that clearly are preferred. Right, right. Like, it's kind of the Lakers' home, right? Right, and then the Clippers. <laughs> yeah. You know? And then hockey happens, like, in between the two. Yeah. But in terms of, like, food, view, like, sight lines, it's great. One of the reoccurring themes that we saw this year was your love of Robert Mueller. Yeah. What a guy. <laughs> Good old Bobby Mull. Yeah. Uh, what do you think... Wow, that was a long time ago. What do you think he has? Uh, I think he takes his job seriously. But no, what do you think that he actually has in his bag of evidence? Like, once the, the election's done, yeah. oh, I mean, that election that happened last week, right. that it was safe and legitimate and fair and nobody got hurt, <laughs> yeah. and it was a great day for democracy, and everything worked out really well. Yeah. Uh, after that happened last week, yeah. wink, wink, what do you think... He has. Like, do you think that he's got 
the answer to to all the problems in America and that he's going to be able to pull out this shiny object and 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 bring it into things or do you think that he doesn't have much of of anything it's a good question i haven't really thought about it cuz i'd feel foolish to think he had the answers mhm uh i don't know i don't think he has what it takes at this point but also he's the kind of guy who would have the tools and has to he and knows it takes the right moment. I have been predicting, and only the future knows, but I have been predicting that he was waiting for last week's election because he knew if he brought any evidence to the table, he could get fired. There weren't enough people around to back it or to pay attention to it or to give it its due justice. So my thought has always been that he's been like a good sports team. Writing out the clock. Right. Game management, time management is a big part of it, right? Yeah. And so I've always had that vibe. We'll see. Waiting till the second half and the sun's not in his eyes. <laughs> I love I love real <laughs> shitty teams like the Dallas Cowboys, where they designed their new ATT uh, or a stadium or whatever it's called, so that the sun at four o'clock shines yeah. right through the windows in the visiting team's bench. They can't Excellent. see shit. Right. <laughs> what dickheads, Jerry Jones. But you did a lot of Mueller uh, illustrations. And and how does that go over? Do you get people that are like, I used to like you. Is that politicized or do people just enjoy it? No, people do that. Yeah. Uh, and that's fine. I'd rather they come out and say that so they can just move on. Yeah. That's Mike Mitchell's uh, approach to it. He gets a lot yeah. of that. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, it is crazy, though, like how people will be like, whoa, I am surprised this is your take. And I'm like, really? Like, what? <laughs> you thought I was like a hard Trumpy guy? What about my red and white hat? Do you not understand? Yeah. <laughs> what about my hat that just says hat, hat, hat on it? <laughs> uh, yeah, I I do get some weird satisfaction finding out like who's following me that is Offended. clearly not a buddy. Yeah, yeah. Or just coming in from a completely different perspective. And you're like, oh, never figured you for one of those. I've had some of those people drop into my DMs. Mm. And because I'll say like, you know, you can unfollow me or like talk civil, you know, calmly to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And they are just full caps lock, all insults, hard stuff. And I'm like, this isn't how this conversation should be going. You know, the conversation I've been waiting to have for two years and I never have is that I've been waiting for somebody that's politically opposite of me. Yeah. To say, hey, I want to sit you down and tell you why I am pumped. For everything that's happening. Right. <laughs> and, and I want them to not just tell me why I'm wrong, but to tell me what they see that makes them feel right. Yeah. Because I'm always trying to get like, I try to check myself before I wreck myself. And I want to make sure that I'm not caught up in a, in a media like fake news thing and that I'm not like this dummy that's just going blindly yeah. against this poor guy. But I've yet to have anybody intelligently give me... The other perspective, other than be like, well, Obama did this. I'm like, he's, right. he's gone, dude. Get over it, man. He's gone. Yeah. Still bummed out about the black guy that had the job, yeah. huh? Like, so I'm always waiting for that moment. And whenever I, you know, I get vocal, all I get is shut up and go back to talking about art. But right. I never get like the thing that you're missing is, is it what everything that's happening today is a 10 year plan for greatness. Right. And I also still haven't got that cold job I've been waiting for. So I just feel double out. Right. Still podcasting until coal opens back up. Yeah. Those 3,000 dudes that'll save the country. Uh, my dream was always to die of cancer with blackface. So <laughs> you did a poster for Newfound Glory. Yeah. At the Troubadour. Uh -huh. Is this you being buds with Newfound Glory because you're from back in the day? Or is this you just being a dialed in LA guy? Merch guy. Merch I know, guy. I know the merch guy. You know the merch guy. Yeah, for that tour. For that tour. Once again, this is what you do sometimes. Sometimes you do the ribbon look. <laughs> sometimes you just do the pile of shit look. Uh -huh. On the pile of shit look, <laughs> how? You know, I don't know that I do this until you tell me I do it. And then I'm like, you bet I do that. <laughs> <laughs> Complete ownership. There's no, it's not, I'm not defensive at all. It's like, you bet. I'm yeah. a rib, I, I do ribbons or I do a pile of shit. Of shit. So on the pile of shit look, which I, I love it because. I'm so fascinated on where do you start and how do you know when to end? Like to me, it all looks, this looks like pavement sounds. Oh, oh wow. Thank you. Pavement always sounded like it was getting ready to fall apart. Yeah. Jangly. But it didn't. Yeah. But it, cause it was always a hit 
and it had a stronger verse chorus relationship than most songs that were designed to be catchy. Yeah. But it had that loose kind of lazy, right. strummy, you know, too much Fender reverb sound to it. Yeah. And that's what this looks like to me. That's funny. And I'm always curious, like, oh, I'm, wait. <laughs> I'm way too planned. Like, how, where, do we, where do you start here? Hey, Mark. Yeah. Is there a misspell in this one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I Dave clocked up. Re, go. Can you zoom in on the copy? Kind of. Here, I'll show you on my phone. The anniversary? You bet. I spelled anniversary wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that? Uh, I knew after it was all done. God. You bet. <laughs> I love it. I don't even need to sign posters. I sign them with spelling. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's an original. Don't worry. Oh, this is a real Dave clock. Yeah. He spelled new and you. Okay, you got a sloth. Is yeah. this a sloth? Yeah. Okay, you got a sloth with what gold bars? Gold bars. Okay, where does that even come from? Uh, I had a lot of gold ink, and I <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know, I sh- I want to do a lot of coverage of gold ink. What an artist statement! <laughs> I had a lot of gold ink, and uh, I wanted it to be just four colors. I wanted to do this color scheme, and I was like a green sloth holding gold bars. And, you know, when you do the pile, it's mostly because you have to, the shadowing is what makes it look like a pile, Mm -hmm. the light source. And Mm -hmm. I was like, a strong overhead light source will make this pile of gold look cool. So when you're doing something like this and it needs a strong overhead light source, is there a point on your draftsman table that you're imagining like the light's always coming from this spot? Because for me, the thing I always do is I always pretend on my monitor, the apple is the sun. Yep. And so everything is coming from that apple. And so I, as I'm illustrating, even if I'm zoomed in at 500%, which uh-huh. I promise myself don't go past 250, right. but if I'm in at 500 and I'm in way too deep, right. I'm like, there's the apple. That's how it would hit this object. Yeah. So do you 100%. always have an object around your draftsman table where you're like, that's the source? I put a circle above the drawing. Oh, I never thought about that. I have uh, 19 by 25 paper. Uh-huh. No, 19 by 24. So two inches in on each side makes it exactly the ratio of 18 to 24. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I do, I, I have two inch margins on all my drawings. Mm-hmm. So I put a big circle wherever the light is. Circle gets a square. Circle gets a square. <laughs> circle takes a square. You went to Hawaii this year? Twice. Oh, spoiler alert. <laughs> well, damn it. You're time traveling on me. Had you been to Hawaii before? No. I, I went not. to Hawaii in the last calendar year for the first time ever as well. It's wild. It doesn't feel like anything other than Hawaii. Like right. it never feels like Tuesday. It doesn't feel like Saturday. <laughs> right. I was there during Halloween. Never once felt like fucking Halloween. Yeah. Every day in Hawaii feels like a day in Hawaii. Yeah. It's completely unique, uniquely its own thing. And I don't know anyone who would move there and want anything else. So it'll probably stay that way. It's fantastic. You know, the one thing I was bummed out about Hawaii though. Leaving? Uh, well, yeah, that. And I, I was surprised at how much it felt like America. Yeah. Because it has all of our infrastructure. Right. And it's like as soon as you go out of San Diego into Tijuana, you know you're in another country. Right. Like everything just visually changes. But there, you fly out into the middle of the ocean. It's all our signs. It's the way that we pave highways. It's the way that we put guardrails on roads. Like all of the infrastructure is so completely American. It's the template of America. Yeah. But the land is like California on steroids. Yeah. So it was this weird juxtaposition where I felt like I was someplace new, but it always had a strong U.S. familiarity to it, which was kind of a wild vibe. Yeah, I know what you mean. And people told me, you know, you're only six hours from Japan. And then I like looked. Like I like, like somebody told me that. (laughs) You know how somebody tells you, like, you know, you tell your dog, like, you you know when the dog like pays attention to something and they get real strong and their ears spoke up or spike up? Yeah. I got that posture, and I was like looking, and my wife's like, you know you can't see it. Right. I'm like, I know. There's nothing in between. Of course I can see it. But Japan has always felt like another planet. Right. And to be this close to Japan, let's just hop on a flight. Let's go. We're, yeah. we're halfway there. Let's go. I want to go there so badly. I'm going next week. Are you? Uh-huh. What are you going there for? Thanksgiving. Do they know it's Thanksgiving? No. That's the best part. Yes. Yes. So I went to Montreal last year. Traveling around Thanksgiving out of the U.S., unbelievably cheap. Really? Montreal was 300 round trip. Whoa. Yeah. And Japan was 600. Wow. So you're just going to Japan, you and the girl? Uh Uh-huh. Wow, Dave. How long? 
10 days. Is Tokyo uh-huh. in Japan? Sure is. That's convenient. <laughs> Beyond that, the trivia is I'm going to lose all the questions. I'm going to just give you a heads up. You probably don't want to do this because you're way cooler than me. (laughs) But I'm going to tell you this. There's an amusement park called Tokyo Sea. Wait, Disney Sea? Yes. I'm going. Disney's Tokyo Sea or whatever. Yeah. It is revered as the world's greatest amusement park. Really? Yeah. it, It is the way that it's designed and laid out is unlike anything else that exists on planet Earth. Huh. We are going. I am jealous. We're going for three days. Alexis is a gigantic Disney fan. And it was like And I like her for this. Yeah. I like your I like your front door. Yep. Yep. (laughs) So you're going to Japan. Yeah. Great on. Right on. Uh you said I was asked by Molly Middle Molly Middle Ditch. Molly Middle Ditch to do an illustration. What is this illustration I'm looking at from March tenth? Her husband is Thomas Middleditch. Oh, is, yeah. Tommy yeah. Middleditch. You know who I'm talking about? Not a clue. He's the star of Silicon Valley. Oh. He's the Verizon guy. Yes. He's very funny. Yes, he is. He is great at the character that he plays, whose name that I cannot think of. Richard Hendricks. Yes. I'll be honest. He's 50 times funnier than that character gets to be. Really? Yeah. Which is why he tours doing improv and is in February doing Carnegie Hall. He is hilarious. And that, that show has no shortage of talent. Right. And you add all that in with the social commentary of Mike Judge, it's a winner. You bet. It's a total winner. So that's an illustration for him. Yeah, and it was uh like a real quick like few days turnaround. Mm-hmm. And she was, you know, had like these are the 11 things he loves. Can you somehow put them all in one drawing? And I said yes. It's interesting that you kind of get that gig of illustrator gift for hire yeah i love it yeah it's cool i mean it's in your personality to please so it makes sense (laughs) a lot of people i don't think would have that in them you went to flatstock this year yes was that your first time no this was my second this was my first austin flatstock oh i'm sorry yeah but your austin to me is the flatstock Flatstock. which is crazy because printmaking is chicago yeah 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 but But this is where it started right it was my first ever flatstock it's definitely the bigger one yeah, and it sort of has the ancestry that Chicago It's the lacks. Timberland boots to the Chicago's slip-ons. <laughs> there you go. You know, they're both shoes, but... One was there first. When you need to be taken seriously, you you put on your Tims. Meanwhile, you're wearing very nice boots, and I am barefoot. Thank you. And I appreciate your barefoot. I get to see all your cool tattoos I never saw when we were in the streets of L.A. Oh, yeah. Nothing so- beats the faded gig life tattoo on my foot <laughs> with the infinity symbol I got on my last tour. <laughs> That's, you know, that's when you know it's going to end. Like, yeah. I, there's like dumb things where I'm like, you know, I've never painted my office. I'm sure if I paint my office, that's the month we decide to like move out of our house. Right. Let me ask you this. How was doing the the flagship, the main flat stock in Austin, Texas? Like, how was that for you? Uh, it was almost the career ender. Why? It was the worst. That was the worst thing I've ever done. <laughs> Explain. Do tell. Um. It was no one's fault, but I sold so little for such a long period of time that I was whittled away to nothingness emotionally mm-hmm. by the end of day two mm-hmm. uh, that a kid came up. I It was five o'clock. It was closing at six. I hadn't sold anything that day. Uh, I was in a good spot, so there's, that's not an excuse. Uh, my stuff was put up well, not an excuse. Um, I had a ton of band posters with bands that they knew, not just like small metal bands. And a little kid came up, I mean like a four-year-old and pointed at one and said, cool. And I just started sobbing (laughs) and I like gave the kid uh, his, he said, cool. And then he grabbed on his dad's pant leg and he's like, that's cool. And the dad was like, we can't buy any more posters. And I was like, will he put it up in his room? Like, can he put this up in his room? And like, yeah. And I was like, then just take it. And I just gave him the display one and then just lost my mind and then just basically continued to lose my mind until the next morning. And that was on what day? Friday. And it was, no, that was Saturday. It was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That was Saturday. Yeah. And so why was it not successful for you? I mean, I lost probably $1,200. 
But why were I don't understand why were you not converting cells? Like why were people not drawn to your work? I think it's an oversaturation thing. You know? Uh-huh. I think it's like if you have the budget to buy three posters, you're in a very small that's like the top five percent. Mm-hmm. And you've probably bought them from the three best. Mm-hmm. And if I'm in the top twenty of eighty, I feel good about myself in my career, mm-hmm. but I'm not making any sales at flat stock. So you're not going to go back. I'm going back. I already got my place. <laughs> I Here's the thing. I also have committed. This is my job, my career. If this goes away, there's nothing. Mm. So I have to keep trying. And I also know that flat stock sales are not a direct representation of how things are going. Did you have any art prints for sale? I don't remember. I had no proof that anything was for sale. <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> That's the spirit I love. <laughs> because you go there because it's a gig poster show. Right. But what you end up selling is art prints. I am the fool that made a huge run of flat stock posters. Yeah, that's a, also a fool's move. Dude, I left with the exact amount. Yeah. Back in my day when we did our first ever exhibit at flat stock, it was 2015 was our first flat stock, I believe. And um, Dave's eating the candy corn, by the way, if you hear a little something. Oh, no. Mike, I'm also taking some of your water. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Um, the, the flat stock poster used to be a thing that you would make, and you would sell a couple, but it was more of like you would trade it with other flat stock people. Right. <clears> and <throat> it went each year from being less and less profitable, less and less trading to the eventually like, I'm not going to make one of those because it's a mess. That's really surprising to me that um, you didn't do very well because you seem like a very beloved guy in the poster scene. You know what? I'll tell you this. And what, what makes me want to go back is that I made friends. People were so unbelievably nice. The other printers. Right. You know, like it was a lot of printers literally coming up to me and being like, hey, I'm so and so. I just wanted to say hi. We've never met. And I'm like, oh, it's so great to meet you. And they're like, how are you doing? And, you know, I'd be like, okay, Dave, just lie. <laughs> yeah, you don't <laughs> And then do I that. wouldn't. You don't do that. Right. And I was like, really bad. Uh, I haven't sold anything. And just my Airbnb alone has, like, you know, bankrupted me. And then I would lose my mind. And they'd be like, hey, you seem like a really emotional dude. <laughs> so this is the thing, and which is funny because you're like the most happy-go-lucky guy I've ever met in my life. So to catch you in that mindset would be odd. This is, well, although I've caught you in that mindset before when we were doing our live show yes. from Fairfax. Yeah. The darkness is around the corner. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you're like me. You're either flying high or in the bottom of the fucking hills, man. Yeah. Or at the bottom of the valley. So this would be my uh, evaluation of what you could do to maybe make it better. Because I was... Not to brag, but very successful in that space. Mm -hmm. So the gig poster is the hardest thing that I've ever sold because checkbox one, people have to like your artwork. Checkbox two, people have to like the band. Right. Checkbox three, some people feel like a poser if they weren't at that show. Yeah. So you're basically making a product that's only right for Cinderella. Right. And if it's the glass slipper... They'll buy it, but the chances are they'll be like, that is the glass slipper, but it's a size seven right. and I need a six and a half. Yeah. And so then you can't even get it on because it's too baggy. It's, that's an extremely valid point, which is something I need to remind myself when I'm like, all of these sold well the day after the show. Look at all of them together. I'm going to, you know, clean house. And then I just stand there for 72 hours and that's it. And as it's gone on. South by Southwest has a lot of return people and the newness of flat stock has worn away and gig posters. And so what I would advise you to do is to take your artwork, which is fantastic in, in your, your mind and make some art prints yep. and try to go for some topics or, or, um, you know, pieces in the artwork that would catch that consumer yeah. or catch the spirit of what people are there to do. Um, because you're not short of good ideas. You're definitely not short of talent or know how to do what you're doing, but what you need are a couple of those universal icons in your booth that will resonate to more people that right. go Foo fighters is kind of long in the tooth. We already have a lot of posters in our house. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're, you're really going uphill. Um, and I would also recommend 
I cannot stress enough, low cost table items. You bet. Pins, patches, stickers. I was so far from eight that by ten prints that I gave away my table. Oh, like someone else needed a table, and I was like, I don't have anything for the table. You can take my table. So it was just me and a seat. Yeah, and a double. I got a double booth. Oof. So it looked like I was holding someone's space. Yeah, because it was like this sad guy probably didn't make this stuff. It was rough. The guy I was sitting next to, a guy named Paul Hess. Goes, yeah, I know Paul. Awesome dude. He saved. I would have been face down if it wasn't for Paul. Yeah. Paul, if you're out there, great guy, great designer, saved flat stock for me. It is a it is a rough thing to do to sit in a booth when you're not moving units and it's not going the way that you're going. You bet. And you start to do this weird, like sadistic thing to yourself where you go, okay, I now need to make 150 an hour to make this work out. Right. And then one o'clock comes and you go, okay, it's now 175 an hour to make yeah. this work out. <laughs> yeah. Three o'clock comes, you're like, I'm at 200 an hour. The last day comes, you're like, okay, I really need to just have like a $2,000 day, divide that by, the, like, I need to be making 300 bucks. You know, it just doesn't. I went home early. I don't blame you. Uh, also, there was some external factors that made it tough. Uh, I had a Nest camera on the in my house. Mm-hmm. And while my girlfriend was at work, we had someone in our backyard looking into our house with a knife. Oh, that's great. So she was staying, obviously, at our friend's place, and I flew home early to fight that guy barehanded, and I won, and it made the weekend cool. That part didn't happen. <laughs> Luckily, though, your your outdoor cat was there. Uh, yeah, he fought him off. Hey, friends, we got a lot more Dave Clock coming up for you today. I hope you're enjoying our hangout. To hear the entire part of today's episode and to support Adventures in Design, that's the part I really want to drive home is that it's like, you know, you really should be paying just to hear the first part of the show. And I'm just kind of putting my foot down today because I just keep seeing all the trade papers talking about podcasting and podcasting. And, you know, it, where is all this going to go if people can't make money off of it? And I'm sure whatever you're doing today, you're doing it well. And hopefully you're making a fair wage for it. And that's all I ask. I just I just want a fair wage for the work that I do. Uh, and I don't think that's too much to ask for. So if you Enjoy what you're listening to and you're getting value of it. I would really urge you to bend your mind to think that it's not just about the bonus content. It's about supporting all of the content. Because if the Circle of Trust numbers ever fell to a moment where I couldn't justify it as my income, the show would have to go away. I'd have to go find a job. And I've been working on my resume. I'm, I'm getting pretty good at a, a couple of things. I think I could get a real Hollywood job. Like, I, I think I could go work at a production studio someplace and... Uh, roll up my sleeves and really crank out some stuff because my resume on what I've been able to do, it's pretty amazing. Why am I bragging about myself on trying to get a new job? What, what's the matter with me? What's the matter with you? Head over to AID.network, become a member of the Circle of Trust, and just know that you are a supporter. You're one of my partners in the content. This time of year, people start Christmas shopping, people start cutting back on their money, and they think, oh, you know, who doesn't need change in his cup? Old man Bricky. Not true. I always need change in my cup. And you need the change in your career. And it all starts right here, listening to Adventures in Design. What a horrible segue that was. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for hanging out with Dave Clock and myself. And to hear the entire show and all of Old Friends Come Home Week, including all of these old friends' previous episodes, head over to AID.network, become a member of the Circle of Trust. Gracias. Moving up to March, the end of March. You did posters for Queens of the Stone Age in Honolulu. Yeah. What a fantastic gig to get hired for. Yeah. I'm, you know, just always so pumped I get asked to do stuff like that. 24 by 36 inch. Yeah. Dip tech. Yeah. Wow, dude. What, yeah. And what this a, paper. What a creation here. I got to show you in person. This is yeah. metallic paper, mm. not foil. Not foil. It's metallic flecked thick cover stock. So it shines. Uh, so the negative space is the lava. Yeah. And it's really cool in person. It is impossible to photograph. I hate the poster you can't photograph. Here it is. And there's the bunch I have left. It uh, looks great. Yeah. And the foils are pretty cool. But the orange sold it. I had the idea once I saw the paper. What's easier for you? To make a landscape or a character? Character. Character's easier for you than landscape? Yeah. Landscape, 
is surprisingly kind of hard to get it to feel somewhat real. Yeah. I'm literally drawing a landscape right now, and it's a real mind bender for me. It is. I mean, the thing is, is you've seen a tree basically every day of your entire adult life. I dare you to sit down and draw one and get it right out of the gate and make it feel like it looks natural. Can't. There's a there's a a very particular way that a tree tapers too. Everything's always getting thinner, and if you just don't dial that in, it looks unnatural. You bet. And my tree stumps, I always start. They're just cylinders up and down, mm-hmm. and I'm like, ah, oh, I forgot how to draw. <laughs> but like Dan McCarthy can draw 200 trees in one poster. Yeah. And you're like, he's just tracing, and he's not. He can just pull a tree out like that. It is. It's an art form like anything else that you, once you do it and do it and do it, it's got to be where you can kind of figure out like, like I I was doing a lot of architectural stuff towards the end of my career and I would always go over and look at my buddy James Flames' work because it never seemed as if he was drawing the same leaf twice. Right. And I really studied what he was doing because I'm like, there's got to be a pattern in here. Yeah. To where he could sit down at his table and knock out. 50 leaves or, you know, five hours worth of leaves, you know, subconsciously yeah. and get it done. And, Cause it, it, it's really, it sounds easy until you sit down and you try to make a landscape and you're like, but it, this doesn't feel legit. It doesn't feel like it's real to me. Yeah. What is this illustration you did for Coachella in April 20th of the guy on the bridge? Oh, that's not Coachella. This uh, well, it says hashtag Coachella on the first one. The oh, pencil. that's just me being funny. <laughs> I wanted it was during Coachella. Oh, okay. and I wanted the followers. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you got me. Every once in a while, I'll do like a hashtag Beyonce just to see what I can get. Yeah, I I, I was back in April and I saw the original <laughs> illustration. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Hashtag Coachella. Yeah, I didn't know what to say about it, so I just did hashtag Coachella. You just went with what was trending. Yeah. Well, this is what I would like to do right now. <laughs> Oops. I would like to, um, I'd like to before, well, we're getting ready to hit the circle of trust here, but uh, or we're maybe in it. What I would love to do is I would love to um, bring by a little Thanksgiving miracle. Ooh. Bring a little gift by. A quirky turkey? A quirky turkey. Last year, as you know, for Hanukkah, I brought all these envelopes. And I was like, what a presentation, open one, open one, open one. And I basically gave Dave my entire print shop. (laughs) There's the rack right there. I saw it. I saw as soon as I walked in that little guy, he's done, he's done some heavy lifting for me over the years. Very important. This is what I got for you this year. Um, I'm really good friends with the guys over at the violent gentleman hockey club. Yeah. You may be aware of them. Sure. And they're really good friends with this little upstart team from Las Vegas called the Las Vegas Golden Knights. Maybe you heard of them. I have. So the Las Vegas Golden Knights are working with the guys over at Violent Gentlemen to do a poster series. Oh. (laughs) But unlike the King's poster series, which is just digital and everybody gets one, these are limited edition, 18 by 24. Holy hell. Silk screens. And they're done for a limited amount of fans. And the idea is that they'll sell out at every game. Yeah. Uh, and that some will get autographed and, you know, go to extreme collectors and, and, and people with the team. And so Violent Gentlemen, this is why I like those guys. They know what they're really good at. Uh-huh. And then they know everybody else who's really good at what they're good at. And I was given a proposal of, Bricky, would you like to be our art director and curator for our Golden Knights poster series that we're doing officially with the NHL and the team. Holy hell. And I said, I would love to because it would put me back in the game of design. It would give me some new art stories. And also, I feel like my eye for art has improved because instead of being busy keeping like up with my own talent, I've had the, the, the blessing now of four years of observing everybody else and thinking about why does this work? Why is this successful? Why is this guy talented but nobody cares? Right. So one of the gifts, or the gift that I'm bearing this year is Dave Clock. Would you like to be one of my artists, a paid job of making an official silkscreen gig poster for the Las Vegas Golden Knights? Thank you for listening to Adventures in Design podcast. To hear part two of today's episode, visit adventuresin.design. 
Click where it says Circle of Trust and help support the only daily talk show designed for creative professionals just like you. Thank you for listening. Good day and good design.